this is a panel of endless murmuring, remembering what we were doing back in the Virginia ages with Ken Kruger and some of us Virginia ages. Ken Kruger grabbed us up and forced us to work with slave waiting days. Uh, he paid us nothing, but we had a great time. This is the panel to celebrate Ken Kruger, who was, in a sense, at least one half of the, uh, of the, the uh, inspiration of the foundation of Comic Con. There were really two groups, and we'll get into this detail now. Scheldorf got one group going, Mike can talk about that. We're going to work our way through the history of those early days and celebrate Ken's. Uh, of course, Ken was not just the founder of Comic Con, he was a publisher, he was a bookseller. He had all these different areas, part of the distribution chains, he's, he's part of the history of publishing too. He published some of my early work. Uh, who else got published by him early on here? Uh, John, Scott, John, John, Scott. Yeah, uh, we would all hang together at Ken's store, and he would he would do things like hand out pulp artwork from the 40s and 50s and give it to us. You know, just to encourage us, for he and John Hall, his partner in crime, would sell us collector's items for a pittance, pittance by today's standards. Just an amazing time. So. For one, I, I, I'd like to just say right now what we need to do to start off this whole thing and get us in the right mood is let us celebrate Ken Cooper with a big round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like this just to be as informal as possible. So who is the most energetic about discussing Ken at this point? Yes, David. Well, I think I, I think I have maybe the, for San Diego, earliest uh, awareness of Ken Kruger. Uh, my, uh, I would, there were a bunch of us uh, science fiction fans at Crawford High School, Greg, you know, Roger Friedman, Scott John, John Pound, who's not here today, uh, and a guy named Kevin McClary, uh, who I don't think is here at the convention this year, but he's still in San Diego. And um, Kevin and I were, uh, were, well, all of us were uh, collecting science fiction books and various kinds of old pulps and things like that. And uh, Kevin liked E.E. E. Doc Smith. I was buying the early hardcovers of mail order from a guy back in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he sent him a you know, mimeographed book catalog. And uh, this guy Kruger put up notes in there that he was relocating from New York and he was coming to San Diego. And so I was like, oh, Kruger's coming to San Diego. So we went looking for his bookstore and, and soon opened shop in Ocean Beach down on uh, Main Drag there in, in Ocean Beach. I didn't know any of that. Yeah, yeah, McClary was buying for him before he, before he moved to California. And so when he moved, when he opened his bookstore, we already kind of knew who he was and went down and I think bought a couple of little coxmen and some other things and I got a, a copy of, uh, of the Lovecraft's Dream Quest of Unknown k -Death. That was another one of those yeah, young struggling writers that he published early on. Yeah, a kid from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. He's already dead. Um, and, uh, so Ken was uh, already known to us. He was, of course, a member of First Family. And he was very active uh, at the age that we were then in the science fiction fandom back in New York. Oh, George. And, uh, and was a member of First Family. He went to the first World Con in uh, New York City. And, uh, Knew all these uh, characters, and then lived. He lived for a while in a, in a, in a communal fan situation called the Slan Shack, uh, and he take, it took its name from an A.E. Van Vogt novel about a uh, Superman, uh, the Slans. And the science fiction fans of the '40s were, uh, you know, we thought we were uh, outsiders and a minority population, but to be a fan or to be a fan in those days. Fan is a proud and lonely thing, and uh, they were few and far between. And so, getting even a few of them together in one building was a really, really big deal. And, uh, and so, we sort of picked up on that on that tradition. But there were a lot more of us. Certainly in Crawford High School, which had 3,000 plus students, there were a fair number of interesting uh, fantasy, science fiction, comic guys. <coughs> it was the biggest high school in San Diego, and then. Patrick Henry opened, and then they were the two biggest high schools in San Diego. And we had, you know, so much of a support group at that time, but to have a adult that, and a real adult, I mean, you know, smoked and cussed and drank and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, taught us how to do, do things that normal men do, even though we weren't normal men. 
Some of us did. I was a bit older. I was one of the, uh, I was really an outsider because when I first met Ken, I'd only been in the United States for about a year, two years. I grew up in the Philippines on all these native bases. And uh, believe me, if you felt isolated at your high school as a fan, you can imagine what it was like being on a Navy base where only a thousand people were there in the yeah, 50s and the 60s. Yeah. Um, but I remember uh, I was in Ocean Beach uh, to uh, score some drugs, as I recall. This was like <laughs> the early 1970s. And uh, I was a long haired, certified, card carrying hippie. And I wandered into this bookstore, and I, I honestly met Ken totally by accident. First time, totally by mistake. I saw this guy with a beard behind the counter smoking a cigar, and his head surrounded with this nimbus of smoke. And I walked in and I thought, well, this is kind of cool. Here's this old guy smoking a cigar in his own store, and we started to chat. And um, as an ardent bibliophile and movie buff and comics fan, I was talking to the right man. I, I'm not going to, in any way, shape, or form, monopolize this, but I did want to. The main reason why I'm up here is because. Ken had a huge heart. That's what I loved about him. Emotionally, he was, uh, I think, to many of us, kind of a surrogate relative, maybe like the crazy uncle or the kindly father we all wanted. To. And we were all crazy fans at the beginning of what is now something so organized and so disorganized and so crazy, even crazier back then. And yet, here was this anchor, this guy you could talk to your deepest feelings about. When you had problems, he would listen, constantly would give you advice. And that's the Ken I remember. That's the guy I'm here to celebrate. Yeah, you know, he, uh, uh, Ken, uh, talking about his old days, he said, he told me one time, he said, you, you guys, you kids, every generation thinks they invented everything. You guys think you invented smoking pot. <laughs> yeah, they smoked pot in 1940 in this ranch. Oh my God, what? what? <laughs> what? It's, it's true, every generation thinks they invented all kinds of things. It was neat knowing somebody who didn't pretend, you know, that it was new. I remember Mike from the, uh, the early days, 1978, what's your memories of first encountering Ken and, and setting up this partnership? Well, I think uh, one thing that struck me about Ken is, it, it, it's, uh, to say the least, he had a strong personality. But it seems, and I thought back about this, and I, I think everybody liked Ken. I mean, I couldn't think of, there were different, you know, like, People would rub each other the wrong way, comment on and ban them. But I can't recall anybody who didn't like him. I honestly can't. And I don't know if that was if, if that's a, a true recollection, but that's my memory about it. And I know at the time, comic fans were really looked down upon by our society. If you were ten, you know, if you were over ten years old, and you read a comic, there was something wrong with you. And I know that uh, even science fiction fans who were still looked down so much by society at large. They looked down on us. And, but here's Ken, who was uh, uh, had this great history in fandom, had, had, had been an early fan publisher, had been the key guy establishing one of the early local science fiction societies at the World Fantasy League. Um, he'd been the first science fiction convention, the Worldcon. And, and here, you know, when we walked into his store, and previously to that, we'd been meeting like Michelle Doris' parents' apartment in Claremont. And we walked into the store with all this wonderful atmosphere, and he just welcomed us. And I never, I'm sure he didn't particularly care for the superhero comics or the things that we were into, but you know, he just recognized us as another species of fan, and he just accepted us, and he supported everything we did. And um, Comic Con wasn't his life, you know, he had a lot on his plate, and, and, and he was a busy person, had a lot going on. But despite that, when the when convention rolled around, and, saw there was something that he had done that was a problem, he, he would jump in and he would do it. And he was the guy who knew how to do it. Because he was the person of great worldly experience. And we just knew that here was the guy, if there was any kind of problem, he could take it to him and he could, he could solve it for him. I remember Ken saying, every successful organization has a ramrod. One of you guys has got to be the ramrod. You've got to get things done. <laughs> I also remember Ken not, uh, even though he was so beloved by most of us, uh, Ken was, could be very prickly. He, he was very outspoken. And I, I won't say the author's name, but I remember he told me a story once about a very well-known science fiction writer who was breaking big at that time, who he did not like at all. 
And uh, the long story ended with this guy autographing a bunch of books of his at Ken's store, and Ken actually threw them out. And I asked him, I said, Ken, why'd you throw those books out? And he had a classic reply, he said, some asshole wrote it. <laughs> <laughs>
cartoonist to a long-haired, uh, uh, drug-taking, underground cartoonist. <laughs> and I'm down there because it was uh, Ocean Beach was kind of a, it, was, it wasn't sleazy and, and sinister, but it was definitely about the, the most countercultural you could get in San Diego. I remember they had a head shop called the Black, it was as big as a Kmart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm walking around down there, and I remember they had, they had a very weird newsstand that had a magazine that I still wish I had. It was a nudie magazine of a girl posing with a six foot tall foam plastic Tyrannosaurus skeleton. And she wasn't doing anything dirty with it, but I thought, and I, and I loved dinosaurs to an almost sexual degree when I was a kid, the brain of sex was. But even I was like, this is too weird to even pick up. And anyway, about two doors down the street from there, here's Ken's store. And I walk in there, because I, you know, back then I was always buying news books and sci-fi and comics and all that stuff. And I go in, and I can't tell if it's a porno store or a, or a, a science fiction store. But I might as well mention it now because it's my number one memory of Ken. Is when it was, and this was not, a, you know, a, a Borders or something. This was a real crummy little store, with lots of dead flies in the windows and all that sort of thing. And on a tall shelf, on the top of a tall bookshelf, Ken had this this object that he had gotten so many questions about. It was probably about a foot and a half tall, and maybe, I don't know, six inches in circumference. It was dark brown, <laughs> and it was a big penis. And Ken had put on a three by five card he taped, he said, it said, it's a candle. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that sums up Ken. Because here he had this ridiculously obscene object in there, he answered questions about it from every half-wit that walked in and decided, I don't want to have to explain this anymore. I'm going to put a sign on it. And to me, it was so hilarious because it was like, yeah, that, that's like what I, I still think. When I think, Ken, that's the first thing I think of the poor guy. But I can't help it because it represented his mindset. Anyway, um, I somehow recall that, that I was kind of maybe the first guy to shop because after that we were all down there all the time. I think you actually discovered it and Claire, we knew he had moved. Yeah. And Claire didn't mind the books from him. I owed him something from Kevin. But you I actually I think are the one who actually found the shop. At first physically went in there the first time. Right. Also you had a car. You had a car. Yeah. And the chicks loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Volkswagen square back, a lot of room in the back. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was great because, you know, I mean, even since, you know, I mean, most of us grew up as the weirdest kid in elementary school, certainly. And then, you know, in junior high, maybe we meet another weirdo. But at Crawford High, it was like, it was, we had like all the makings practically of a publishing company even among ourselves. We had writers, we had artists, we were all running producing magazines. We, we, we had a, 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 not that I don't think any of us had ever seen an underground film, but we have our underground film society. We were trying to make an adaptation of A Sound of Thunder, shot at the San Diego Zoo with phony rifles. Everybody thought these teenage terrorists just showed up on the zoo. But anyway, my point is, is is, is meeting Ken was kind of like meeting Forey Ackerman because a lot of us have been big fans of Famous Monsters of Film Man and the idea of an adult who was a, uh, a, a fan of all this stuff was pretty mind-blowing to, to guys that were, you know, 17 years old and the idea of guys that were fans actually figuring out how to make their living doing this was particularly appealing to us so here was a guy that was kind of our own Forey Ackerman in our own backyard. And uh, it wasn't long after that, I was working at a, uh, 
the uh, Beat On Bookseller down in Fashion Valley, which had just opened. And I felt that thing, again, the sexual thing, I remember it, this place is sophisticated because they had a big display of, like, pyramid of copies of the Grove Press adaptation of I Am a Curious Yellow in their front window in a shopping center in San Diego. So uh, I got a job there pretty quickly. <laughs> so I wanted to see what else I had in the back. And uh, I wound up meeting uh, one of the prime guys of the, uh, uh, the the other contention the, the, that that uh, you know kind of the uh, Linda wasn't Linda Vista but but it was kind of up in that area that a lot of those guys lived in that and uh, and he Bob Sork anyway was this connective thing and then within probably weeks we all started getting together and I remember a lot of them was on my parents' back because that was a big Shell in, in, in the equation, and, 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 uh, and Mike, and, and, and especially Richard Alf, who I, I people always say, you know, was Shell the founder. Say, well, Shell said he was the founder, but I always, and I don't want to get into that, but I, I used to think that that Ken certainly was as much a founder as Shell because, but Ken never ever looked for any recognition. He didn't give a shit if people knew he was doing good or not. He just did it. And, uh, and Richard was really, in my mind, essentially the third founder because even though he was a kid, he was a businessman already and could afford to put up some money to help put on that convention. And it's great to have good intentions, but if somebody's willing to put their money where their mouth is, I'd say we would have never gotten off the ground without, without some hard cash from a kid with a mail order comic business. Put up the credit cards to yeah. the rooms and stuff like that, which most people don't know. He had a driver's license as well. Yeah, he did. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Cards. He went down to ABC and Tijuana and the other one was even yeah. And he also, he also he never took any credit for anybody's career, which was something. Yeah, absolutely. And again, putting his money where his mouth is, he didn't pay us a lot, but he paid us in cash and he. Uh, was very obviously proud to, to uh, give give us kids, you know, who were still very rough around the edges, both, both personally and artistically, you know, and, and, and got us out there. And, and, you know, I mean, we certainly weren't like hitting the scene like major celebrities, but it's like suddenly we could get people to look at our stuff because we're in a Scott. Scott, you know, you're mentioning Forey Ackerman. Ken, there's a Forey Ackerman, an interesting Forey Ackerman, King Cougar thing. Remember the King Kong issues, the famous monsters? Oh, yeah. With the well, three issues of synopsis of King Kong. Ken wrote that. He goes You're wrote kidding. That. I didn't know that. No, no. That was one of the things, learning from Ken about the realities of the publishing business, the, I, the idea that he could write some, a major piece in Forey's magazine and not have his name appear anywhere on it. Ken didn't care about having his name on it. He, he did it as a piece of work. And those also happen to be, in, yeah, I think, most of our opinion, the best three issues That's of right. famous That's monsters right. ever. <laughs> but uh, let's hear from, let's hear from our Roger. Okay. Thanks very much. I'm Roger Friedman. I'm, these days I'm on the faculty at the University of California, Santa Barbara, working with a lot of kids who are 16 to 18, work with a lot of physics, young physics majors who, like many of us, and for other, perhaps for other reasons, were the, the weirdest kids in their schools and so on. So, so what I find interesting now from the perspective of someone who's supervising kids who are about the same age that we were when all, all this, the nexus that led to Comic Con began, circa 1969, when I was 16, um, it occurs to me that even today I would have a hard time personally giving as much freedom the kids at age 16 as Ken Kruger gave to us. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for what he did, not only the freedom that he gave us, but the responsibility that he imparted to us. And the fact that there was this bookstore, you know, where today you know, we sort of take it as granted, there were bookstores, you can go anywhere, there'll be science fiction, in many cases there'll be all the comic books you could want, you can go into borders for heaven's sakes. But that was a very rare thing at the end of the 1960s. And then here's this bookstore where right on display are all the latest science fiction books along the classics, and you simply did not see that anywhere. 
my sounds. So you have to mention the latest issue of Leather Lab Order. Well, that, 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 <laughs> um, we, won't, we won't talk about that now. But <laughs> it's interesting to note, just in terms of organizational history as well, that you know today, obviously, what rules the roost in San Diego is SDCCI and the, the organization there. But you can actually trace back the history of that to a much smaller organization that actually had its origins at Ken Store, that's where the meetings were held, which was the headquarters for all fanish activities in San Diego. The acronym for which was, of course, half-assed. And, uh, and it's interesting to know that literally out of that half-assed organization that we all began with, and that's it's interesting, that's where my uh, publishing history began, because we cranked out a lot of copies of the newsletter, typed either handwritten by, by me or by Scott, or uh, or actually typed out on mimeograph stencils on my mother's typewriter. Uh, it's interesting that from there, and these days I publish textbooks. There's a, sort of a direct lineage from those fanzines to what I'm doing now. So it's interesting to note just the notion. So we're from little acorns where these giant oaks grow. And but again, I think that coming back to Ken himself, what I really respect him for the most is the fact that he gave us so much freedom to do what we thought was the right thing to do. It wasn't simply, I'm in charge of stuff, and I want you to do this, you to do that, you to do that. It's like, no, you guys go do it. And I'm giving you the, the opportunity to do that, I'm giving you the responsibility to do that, and just stand back and see what happens while providing that adult supervision. And that's a very difficult thing to do for any of you who work with kids, any of you who are parents. And so uh, it, uh, I, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for what he did. And, and we all owe him oh, a tremendous credit. Uh, that a Hi there. I was fortunate enough to um, actually have Ken as a boss in the days of Bud Plant and before that I worked with him and his wife at Pacific Comics. But my first memories of Ken usually revolve alcohol because when I got to know I was her age and why didn't in my beer? Which she did every once in a while. We won't tell anybody. But the thing I love most about Ken is he took you under his wing. No matter who you were, I, I mean, he helped all these people in the funny business, and, and Wendy and I are so colloquially referred to as the was the first girls of fandom. First, we're part of the first girls. The first girls of fandom. I think that's kind of hilarious because I actually didn't get into Comic Con until about the mid eight, um, mid seventies, but I did work with everybody. And when I first saw Ken, my thought was, who is this mom? Because you know he had no stogies, no teeth missing, his hair was disheveled. Mike had a button or two, but it really wasn't buttoned properly, but the man was a walking encyclopedia. He knew music, he knew the comics, he knew science fiction, he knew every genre, and I was just amazed at how much he knew. And he gave me a lot of leeway and a lot of flexibility when I was working with um, a lot of people out here for Bud Plants. He told me what the happy customers are and who the great ones were, and so that was always good information to know. But um, I was so sad to hear that he had passed away after last year's convention because I didn't get a chance to um, honor him. But he used to take us to uh, Fully Base in uh, uh, Little Italy or uh, a bunch of us used to go to Cool Weekends. I still remember the cover of Tina Garrett Those are some good times. And, um, <laughs> especially the Especially the tacos. Well, like I said, you know, alcohol always was around my memories in the early days of Comic Con. But um, I got some notes that I had taken here from uh, a friend of ours, A.G. Clark, who's in um, Louisiana. And I said, dude, I need some information for this trip to Canon. One thing I did not know about the man was he had several stores up in the, the Southern California area, I do believe. And his landlord was Debbie Reynolds, believe it or not. And he had the option to mail his rent checks every month, but he chose to go hand deliver them just so he could look at it. <laughs> Which I would, if I was in his shoes, she's a beautiful woman, you know, and uh, I thought that was kind of cool. And um, there's uh, Maggie Thompson with Company Fire's Guide when she was little. Uh, he used to bounce her on his knee. And these are some of the things that I did not know about Ken. But like I said, I respect the man, I love him dearly. It does, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> But he was more than fair with all his, his crew. And looking at the audience here, there's Clayton and uh, William 
and uh, Greg, crazy George, I love you honey, how are you? <laughs> and Max and everyone that got to work with Ken, I think they're going to feel the same way I do. He truly and genuinely loved his workers. And he took them under their wing as if they were his own children. And I can honestly say he was the best boss and the favorite boss I have ever had the pleasure to work for. And I requested to be on this panel just so I can pay tribute to Uncle Kim.
pretty, it was, it was, it was kind of sad to see Ken because he was really frail. He was all, he was like a human question mark. He was all bent up and said, spinal problems and all these things. But he was as sharp as he ever was. That was the great thing. Once I realized that he, was, he may have been a physical wreck, but mentally he was the same guy. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to hug him too hard because I didn't want to break him. But, <laughs> but I mean, it was just so, I mean, I, I think my brain has deteriorated a lot more than Ken's did. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not battling. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask about was the end of the story of uh, when did Elton Hubbard say that science fiction was a love game and we should start a religion? And he told me, he says, no one's ever going to believe this. He said, this is the way it happened. And he told me the story again, so I got it. You know, there's probably three different versions of that. But, uh, but Ken was there, he says, in John W. Campbell's office, and Elton Hubbard came in and said that. That's a time machine. I mean, this is last year, and I didn't want to ask about things that happened in the 1940s. A change, you know, science fiction history. That's a time machine. Ken could do that for us over and over and over again, so many times. So we've got people in the audience also who should be sung out here. Uh, Scott, you want to point them out? Wendy, Janice? I, I, I think first off, I think I may, um, Gus and Pete Kruger, Ken's son. There we go. Los Angeles. 
see him there every year. So yeah, I, I just appreciate what he meant to be. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you something I can remember, but I always thought was odd and what you kind of cool was that was you know we thought we thought of Ken as being like the old man on the mountain or something, but he was still a pretty young guy. But but you know he, there was no sense of any kind of real you know, trying to be a hip smooth guy. But he always had those those, those scarves. And like like the guy in Scooby Doo. <laughs> I was like, to me, it was like, well, Ken does have a little style. Ken does <laughs> kind of want to look kind of cool. And it was like, I don't care that you look like you're out of a cartoon. That's fine. That makes you cooler in my eyes. The interesting connection with San Diego and Southern California, and of course, we're close to LA. We're close to the movie industry. We're close to the Corey Ackerman and the Ackerman Mansion. We're close to the screenwriters who are coming down to visit us. Bradbury, who is, you know, king of L.A. and was moving down to all the Comic Cons. This, this, this total mix was part of this whole picture of San Diego fandom. We could get access to nearly every part of science fiction's fantasies, horrors, history, certainly the early stages of it. We would want to do Julie Schwartz. He was H.P. Lovecraft's agent, first agent. He you know, went on to do other things, to hit the, 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 the Solar Age of D.C. and all these other things. But he knew all the people back then. Ken knew most of these people. That was the fascinating thing. And I got a story to tell about Paul here. Talk about some sort of weird coincidental thing. San Diego must have been the Quinn Cumps of science fiction time. Because I got my start, I tell the story over and over again, by being at a officer's club showing in 20 million miles to Earth in Sangley Point, the Philippines, in 1957, I think. And I'd never seen a Ray Harry House. And it blew me away, and I went home that night, and the Emer crawled out of the wall and threatened to eat me. And that was my beginning. I want to, I want to do this to people. I want to scare the royal Jesus out. Of them. You're scaring me right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at Paul Salmon's email address, and it was Sangley Six Outfielders. But anyway, Sangley was in there, and I said, "Do you know about Sangley Point?" And he says, "I was there." I says, "Do you know about?" You know, the officer's club or the enlisted man's club where they showed 20 million miles to Earth? He says, yeah, my dad got that film, showed it for me. That's a true story. My dad was the manager of the club and I was a little boy and I'd always ask her, Dad, can you announce something with monsters in it? <laughs> <laughs> and that is the synergy of San Diego because I only knew about this like eight months ago. We only put this together eight months ago. We were in the same place 4,000 miles away, 20, 40 years after we supposed to so, you know, and then, and then running into the Stardust Convention in San Diego, there was something really going on here. Running into uh, all the people we were associated with, Phil Tippett, David Clark knew Phil Tippett, he later went on to do Star Wars and Jurassic Park, and Starship Troopers and many other things. Something really cool was going on here, and Crawford was a center of it. I ran into Scott Shaw, we argued who was better, Edgar Rice Burrell or H.G. Wells, for an entire summer in summer school. Roger, I met at Pershing Junior High School. And David I met at Crawford High School. These guys I met within two or three years thereafter. And you know, they ruled. I met Paul Salmon when I woke up one morning to find him sleeping on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sweat with, 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 with this gentleman in the front seat in the front row. I remember <laughs> those days quite well. I got some of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I need to make a point too about San Diego itself. I don't remember any of us talking about this at the time, and I'm sure Ken was, was hip enough to realize this, but I only put it together after I was a professional, um, is that San Diego, I mean, I grew up here, I, I wasn't born here, but I might as well have been born here. Most of us kind of took San Diego for granted in a lot of ways. And it never occurred to me, at least, and like I said, I don't remember people talking about it, that, that back then the comic book industry especially was in New York City and the surrounding area. And it never occurred to me that, you know, a freelance cartoonist working for these studios is hunched back there over a drawing table and his kids know the back of his neck better than his face. And his wife was like, honey, you haven't taken us on a vacation in five years. And suddenly, these professionals 
could not only have an excuse because Jack Kirby and, and, and people like that had kind of put their stamp of approval on us, but they could take their family on a tax-deductible vacation to the best vacation place in the United States, and suddenly, instead of being you know, that, that weirdo in the other room that's, that's drawing comics, suddenly Dad's a hero. And, you know, suddenly, suddenly, gee, his, his wife or thinks, you know, hey, wow, he, he finally made good on this. And, and, and between people like, like Jack and Neil Adams being out here and Ray Bradbury and people like that on top of it, I think that's why this convention grew so fast, because the professionals realized that well, not only these people treating us nice, but there's like, you know, in their own personal life, you could improve things for them just by being out here. That was one of the things. The other thing was in the early days, San Diego was the rocking, rock and roll party convention. You know, it was going on all night long, all over the place. You'd, you'd float down the halls on a billow of smoke, you know, from one room into another. Yeah, and that kind of got around too. Yeah, and then we had <laughs> not that we had anything to do with that. Yeah, we're just sure we're going to the the fiction pool. authors trying to crawl out the window and <laughs> yeah. come to the room and get naked yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Jack Kirby setting off fireworks by the pool, as I recall. You no, know, actually, I tried talking him into it by telling him that this big Roman candle was the boom tube. <laughs> for just a fraction of a second, I could tell that Jack really wanted to light that. So <laughs> <laughs> Dan O'Neill going down the halls playing his banjo and drinking whiskey. The shark repellent turned the El Cortez pool into a big bottle of Gatorade. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, there, were, there were no sharks in the pool at all. So. <laughs> the El Cortez was his own character, of, you know, convention character at the time. I'm sure everybody's heard one or two stories about the El Cortez Hotel, but that definitely added to the early days of, of Comic-Con in and of itself. Yeah, I, I just saw Chuck shaking his head. You got, got a story for us, Chuck? <laughs> Well, there were lots of stories about the El Cortez, but <laughs> just as regards Ken, um, the one thing that, that you guys haven't really mentioned is just how fearless he was. He taught me to never be afraid. His favorite expression was, fuck him. All right? he, was just like, he didn't care what anybody thought about what he did, about how he lived his life, about who he supported or didn't support. And when I met him, I was 18 and still fairly trepidatious and not uncertain, but the, the number one thing that he taught me was to live life fully and to just never be afraid and don't give a rat's ass what anybody else thinks. Just do it. And yeah. that was Ken Kruger in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, Chuck said, in 1979, I had been coming to Comic-Con for many years already, but I didn't know Ken at the time. And I had gone up to Northern California to, to do a practice and came back to the Southern California area and I needed a job. So Leonard Brown at the Collector's Bookstore said, hey, I hear Ken Kruger's leaving down at Pacific Comics, why don't you go down and check it out? So I did, they gave me a job and it worked out and I worked with Janet and a lot of people and of course I had to work with Ken and I met him many, many times. And the one thing that I took back from my experience with Ken is he told me, don't let him give you any shit. And that's how I learned business was from Ken Cruz. Because I had no business acumen at the time. Ken taught me how to run a business. And he was like my dad. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, he didn't know how to run a business. I mean, that's the other part of the business. He wasn't a bad editor either, because uh, at the time, and, and I think this was around 73 or so, um, I remember talking to him, and I was just getting into this dual career thing I've had about being in film and being a writer at the same time as publishing. And I was kind of a kind of uncomfortable with that because I didn't know if I could pull it off. And I, I, I remember him once saying, you know, Sam, and he didn't call me by my last name, but I think he enjoyed the fish analogy. Um, <laughs> and he would say something like, you know, Paul, he said, you would know, you know just as much about film as anybody I know, and so there's no reason in the world why you can't go up there and show these Hollywood jerks how to do it, you know. And he would constantly, constantly encourage, he would constantly push. And then when I started to get more serious about my writing, he edited some stuff that I did. He would take it home, and then the next day I would drop by the shop and he'd have markups and corrections and all this kind of stuff. And so to a great extent, I mean, he was formative to me at the beginning of my career, so I owe it. We have yeah, many, many more stories to tell, unfortunately. We are now going to have to, to say, again, thanks to Ken for his magnificent work.